Tonight, ready to crack down on any unlawful sounds of summer. New signs are up at one of Toronto's most iconic intersections. We'll explain the rules performers must follow to strike the right note. A lot of people my age cannot walk from whatever outskirt, whatever street is closest into the park to enjoy it. Plus, more park problems. Why yet another group is demonstrating against recent changes for cars and parking at High Park. He running through all this paper. That's what I do to a hater. And the Brampton rapper sentenced for shooting fellow rapper Megan Thee Stallion. Details on how many years he'll be spending behind bars. Hey there, good evening. I'm Chris Glover. We're beginning again tonight at one of the city's most popular parks. High Park has been the center of high drama lately over recent changes that limit the number of cars and parking spots. Today, it was a group of mostly seniors calling on the city to pump the brakes on the plan. Dale Manukduk gets us started tonight. Roughly 20 people staged a protest outside High Park to raise awareness on the lack of vehicle accessibility. It's not like we live... Uh in a country where we have bicycle rickshaws at the gates that are willing to take people, you know, into the park in some environmentally friendly way. It was a much more tame protest than the one last week where tensions boiled over with counter protesters. David Shelnut posted this video to social media showing one driver pushing a woman with his car. He says he's grateful for the city's weekend car ban, but it doesn't go far enough. The entire park should be car free. Uh, there is no reason why uh, a, a world-class city like Toronto cannot have one place where motor vehicles are not allowed to run rampant and uh, where the car is not king. One of the issues raised by people who are opposed to a car-free high park say that the transit infrastructure isn't in place yet to support that. For example, here at Keel Station, there is wheelchair access and an elevator. However, here at High Park Station, there are no elevators. The TTC's plan does call for two to be operational by the end of 2024. A lot of people my age cannot walk from whatever outskirt, whatever street is closest into the park to enjoy it. The TTC is running a bus through the park on weekends and is allowing wheel-trans access to the park. Meanwhile, the city is in the process of removing 60% of the parking spaces. Cars are not really the big problem. The big problem to me is the bicycle cyclists. Let's have the cars uh, during the week. Let's have cyclists barred all together. The city, however, has made up its mind on which direction it's heading. You can get so close with a car, and the rest of the way you're relying on transit or on a bike or some other way of getting around. One other concern from protesters is that the car ban has pushed vehicles onto the street. It creates a mess for the local people. No parking spaces anywhere. As people learn, that uh, High Park is not a place where you're going to be able to go and park. People change their habits. Councillor Gord Perk says the changes will be hard for some, but in a few years, the park will end up more accessible and safer for all people. Dale Manukduk, CBC News, Toronto. To Caledon next, where a woman is dead after a crash between a car and a tractor trailer early this morning. It happened just after 5 a.m. near Charleston Side Road and St. Andrews Road. The woman was taken to hospital where she later died from her injuries. The truck driver was not hurt. The cause of the crash is still under investigation. Drivers north of the city will likely face some heavy traffic for the next few days. Several lanes on Highway 400 near Bradford are closed, all because of a sizable sinkhole. Yesterday afternoon, uh, the Ministry of Transportation road maintenance contractors identified an issue along the left shoulder of Highway 4 southbound, just north of Line 5. Uh, they found a hole, and it actually expanded to quite a large cavity underneath the asphalt against the uh, median strip. All right, so here are the specifics. The southbound left lane between Highway 88 and Line 5 is blocked. The OPP says expect the northbound left lane to also be closed off. Getting it filled in and fixed, that could take several days. Ongoing labor shortages are straining a number of industries. And tonight, Ontario says it is investing in three projects to attract more women and young people to construction jobs. The first project will help 700 tradeswomen get the training they need to launch and progress in rewarding careers in the industry. 
The second training project will provide 1,500 people with access to online resources and training tools to improve their, school, their skills and connect them directly with employers around the province to find apprenticeship opportunities close to them. And finally, the Tomorrow's Trades program is returning this year to provide 60 grade 12 students in London and Ottawa with hands-on learning opportunities and access to high-profile construction projects. The Labour Minister says $3.6 million is being pumped into the projects, coming from the Ford Government's Skills Development Fund. All told, the province says there's been a $700 million investment to help people find well-paying jobs right here at home. For many workers already on the job, the summer can be grueling at times, with extreme heat often a serious hazard to their health. Tonight, the Ford government is proposing new regulations to protect workers from the high temperatures. Ali Chiasson is on that one for us tonight. And it's so great to be here. As the Ontario Labour Minister, improving worker conditions is a big part of Minister Monty McNaughton's gig. Health and safety, uh, it's, it's their number one uh, priority. And working outside in the summer heat is a big part of the gig for many laborers. I have to applaud them for, for taking this important step. Professor Glenn Kenny runs Operation Heat Shield Canada, which studies the impact of heat and rising temperatures on workers. Heat stress is, is a problem, not just during extreme heat. We have to remember that workers work under conditions that may be with highly insulative clothing that can really limit their ability to thermoregulate. Hot and humid conditions can occur indoors too. You can also have manufacturing where again, you know, perhaps while they may have some level of air conditioning, it's not always uh, enough to, to, to ensure that the temperatures indoor remain sufficiently low that workers might not ne be negatively affected. The new regulations would introduce heat stress exposure limits, new heat stress risk assessments, require employers to mitigate heat exposure, and establish workplace protocol, including recognizing the signs and symptoms of heat-related illness and protective measures. When you're looking at what the government says they'll do, I want to know what it looks like when they enact it. Change is needed, but it you must know, not where, become yeah, just another poster on the wall at the office. Where you see that the regulations exist, but the willingness of the ministry to actually enforce and uphold those regulations, that's what makes it beneficial to workers or not. It's about enforcement, accountability. Inspections, fines, enforcement, generally speaking, you know, where we actually have also um, public awareness campaign that is around it so that workers actually know uh, that this regulation change has come into effect. And given the state of our warming climate, the climate crisis is here, it's present with all of us, and if we don't actually get ahead of it, and if we don't actually hold employers accountable for adequate working conditions, then we are, you know, really just checking a box without making anyone's working life any better. The ministry's heat stress regulations is in the feasibility analysis phase, with more details expected in the coming months. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. 19 degrees and clear tonight as we look live at our beautiful city. Ethan Williams is with us tonight for weather. And Ethan, it was windy for sure, but otherwise a nice afternoon. Well, Chris, we did get some breaks of sun today after a fairly rainy end to the long weekend. But there is another round of showers that will be moving in over these next couple of days here. And that's kind of going to be the pattern over these next few days. Some sunshine, some rain kind of here and there. That system that moved through at the end of the long weekend, bringing through some heavier amounts. Toronto, we picked up about 5 to 10. Eastern sections of the GTA closer to 30 millimeters. Southwestern Ontario, even around 15. But again, closer to Ottawa. Eastern Ontario, that's where we really saw those heavy amounts, close to 90 millimeters in some spots. But the system is moving out. Winds light, nice uh, sunny conditions tomorrow morning as you start the day. By the noon hour, uh, feeling like the low 30s with that sun still sticking around. Bit of increasing cloudiness, though, by the commute home. And we could also see some pop-up showers and thunderstorms at that time as well. The showers, as I mentioned, Chris, are definitely coming. I'll let you know how much we can expect in terms of rain in your full forecast. All right, Ethan, thanks a lot.
Now over to Young Dundas Square, a loud place any time of year, but even louder in the summer months. And tonight, the city says it is ready to crack down on unlawful noise pollution. New signs just went up near the iconic intersection, warning buskers that they need a permit to perform on Toronto streets, and they can't use amplified sound. Anam Khan is live at Young Dundas Square tonight. And Anam, how are people reacting to these new signs? So you can hear the sounds right now. You can hear the music playing pretty, pretty loudly. And I spoke to a busker this evening, and he was really grateful of the new signs that went up. He said when he performs, his acts usually get overrun because it's so loud in this iconic square. And while some people have seemed to be caught up with this new bylaw, it's, uh, it's unclear why others haven't. For locals and tourists alike, summer in Toronto is often synonymous with music filling the streets from performers busking for cash. It's some nice music. It's, uh, it represents a culture from different country. So we like it's like a sensation that uh, and spiritual uh, music. Nathan Silva says he's been performing here nearly every day for the last six months, a few hundred meters away from Young and Dundas Square. He has an audience, but he doesn't have a permit. To be honest, I didn't know. Fearing many street performers were unaware, the city slapped up these new signs recently as a reminder. The bylaw that's been in place for years around buskers says the performers can't have amplified sound and must have a permit. That's a citywide requirement. But the general manager at Young and Dundas Square says organizations like his have been enforcing the rules for decades. We've got, currently got 11 folks who've, who've have a permit with us and we see five of five or six of them on a fairly regular basis i'm happy because they don't respect they don't respect other basket tribu chisa from ecuador is applauding the new signs he says performers without a permit and often with amps are loud and interrupt acts like his all the streets right plus the speakers is is too is too much and these one thing is this and the other thing it's because it's young buskers they don't know the city rules so these guys make noise until 12 1 2 a.m area councillor chris moise requested the signs after complaints from businesses and residents he told cbc news that the measures will clean up noise pollution in the area in a statement to CBC, the city said examples of buskers include musicians, singers, jugglers, and mimes. Amplified sound is not permitted. Never, never. That's what hell is, and that's where you'll go unless you repent and trust in Jesus Christ. The city didn't respond when CBC Toronto followed up to ask about people who identify as preachers who routinely use amp on the street without a permit. But you see that sign over there? Yeah. The amplified sound? Yeah. Did, did you guys have a permit? So actually, that is for street performers. The law, if you look at the law, it's for street performers. We're not performers. We're not defined under performers. We're preachers. The city, meantime, says its enforcement regime focuses on complaints, and only then will bylaw officers investigate possible violations. So the city deploys inform enforcement officers based on a priority basis, and this goes in line with their entire plan, which is to educate first and then take action if necessary. All right, Adam Khan reporting live for us tonight from Young Dundas Square. It was a mixed bag today for our country's tennis stars at the National Bank Open here in Toronto and in Montreal. We'll start with a big Canadian win. Leila Fernandez cruised to a first-round victory over American Peyton Stearns. And she wasn't the only victorious Canadian. In a big upset, Montreal's Gabrielle Diallo beat Dan Evans of Britain to advance to the second round of the tennis tournament. 2019 U.S. Open champ Bianca Andrescu did not enjoy the same feeling of victory, unfortunately. She was knocked out of the first round, as was Felix Auger Aliassime. He was the 10th seed in the tournament and lost without a single breakpoint opportunity. Welcome back. We are tracking new trouble with the TTC tonight. Digital screens in bus shelters are supposed to be relied on to tell you when the next bus is coming, but we've been looking into it and many are not working. Olivia Bowden has more. None of the passengers waiting for the northbound Austin bus bothered to check the digital screen for the next bus information because it's not working. 
Marin Gilbert Stewart takes this bus daily. She says she can't remember the last time it functioned, and it's not the only one. Pretty useless. Um, I don't really notice them, and I guess if I do, to be honest, they are usually broken. The TTC says out of 300 digital screens, 60 across the city aren't working because of weather or vandalism. It says it's taken more time to fix them because it has to rely on its vendor's schedule. I personally have reported multiple digital signs out within the last year. There's no realistic plan. Cameron McLeod is with Code Red TO, a transit advocacy group. He says the screens may seem like a minor issue, but it's all part of the transit system's state of good repair. Transit needs to be reliable and predictable, otherwise those that have other choices will make other choices and they'll leave the system behind. You do something called sweating the infrastructure. You delay maintenance. Professor Shoshana Sachs is the Canada Research Chair in Sustainable Infrastructure. She says the broken screens are indicative of a bigger problem. For the last 10 years and longer, we've underinvested in taking care of our infrastructure. And so little things are looking a little less good or working a little less well. And that's adding up to give a general sense that Toronto hasn't taken care of itself. The TTC says the screens are a pilot project and it doesn't plan on installing any more of them. That's because it says people now mostly rely on their phones to find out when the next bus is coming. Olivia Bowden, CBC News, Toronto. Meantime, the cost of a Presto Transit card just got cheaper starting today. The one-time user fee goes from $6 to 4 and you can use it to travel on the TTC, GO, and the UP Express. And changes at the LCBO are also coming. Starting September 5th, paper bags will no longer be used. Reusable bags will be available for purchase, or you can bring your own. And the decision to eliminate single-use paper bags is part of the LCBO's new sustainability initiative. In April, they partnered with Tree Canada, a nonprofit that promotes the planting and nurturing of trees right across the country. All right, let's get back to Ethan now. And Ethan, lots of sunny periods today, but the wind is what I think I'll remember about today's weather. Well, definitely a breezy one, Chris, in the wake of that uh, low pressure system that moved through that brought all that rain. Lakefront today uh, really kind of through the golden horseshoe, looking at gusts close to 50 at times, but that's beginning to diminish this evening. Also seeing that rain uh, move out earlier this afternoon, we did have some spotty showers in portions of eastern Ontario, but the clouds beginning to clear for the GTA, and we did have a nice afternoon. Temperatures kind of got into those mid-20s for us. Humidex values, especially the further southwest you went, making it feel closer to 30. In terms of our uh, uh, sky conditions basically over these next couple of days here, we will be looking for kind of pop-up showers here and there, especially overnight tonight in the Niagara region. Tomorrow starting sunny and then clouding over with a chance of some showers and thunderstorms in the Golden Horseshoe. And then our next best chance for showers moving through on Thursday with this cold front. Could be some embedded thunderstorms there as well. Generally, two to five millimeters is what we're expecting GTA and southwestward. But east from there, we could get into that five to ten millimeter range. Now, in terms of overnight tonight, seeing clearing skies with mid-teens, a bit foggy at times to our north. Those winds continuing to diminish. Maybe some showers and thunderstorms uh, through the overnight hours in uh, southwestern Ontario before clearing. That's possible again in the southwest tomorrow as we see highs in the mid to upper 20s, feeling 30 to 35 for Toronto, again, showers likely by the afternoon, just kind of pop up in nature. But to our north, looking at mostly sunny conditions. Now, for the GTA going forward, Thursday, again, those rain uh, amounts going to be largely dependent on the thunderstorms that we see. Friday, we get some clearing and have a nice day. But then showers return for Sunday before clearing out, or Saturday, rather, before clearing out for Sunday. But then showers are back on Monday with possible amounts in the 5 to 10 millimeter range there. So we're kind of riding this seesaw bit here, Chris, in terms of our sky conditions, but temperatures not uh, not that bad for this time of year. Yeah, kind of a mixed bag. All right. Thanks, Ethan. Where a judge sentenced Brampton rapper Tory Lanes to 10 years in prison for shooting fellow rapper Megan Thee Stallion. Lanes was convicted in December on three charges, including first-degree assault for shooting Megan Thee Stallion in the feet in 2020. The artist was to be sentenced back in January, but that was delayed when he hired new lawyers.
Back here in Toronto, the 48th edition of the Toronto International Film Festival is just around the corner, and officials have now announced the closing night gala. Do I have regrets? Hell yeah, I have regrets. Sly, a new documentary about Sylvester Stallone, has been chosen for TIFF's closing night on September 16th. TIFF officials say they'll respect protocols regarding the participation of striking union members at the festival. Here's something pretty cool. Ports Toronto is getting two trash tracking aqua drones to clean up the lake. Think Roombas, but for the water. Check it out. It's essentially a uh, Roomba that operates on the surface of the water, cleans up microplastics, debris, things that we don't want on the surface of the water, and then we're able to dispose of it properly afterward. The Way Shark is an aqua drone, so it operates remotely, so we have an operator standing on the shore or on a dock, and it's kind of like, uh, like operating a video game. So there's a remote control, and they can control the, uh, the Way Shark. It can get into the nooks and crannies uh, along the dock walls, a lot of hard to reach areas where we know that waste and floating debris can accumulate. It's a really exciting new capability that will add to our existing program. Not to worry, the Siemens are sticking around. We know that they're effective. With their help, we've taken out hundreds of thousands of pieces of plastic pollution from the Toronto Harbour since 2019, but they're static. So they move up and down. Um, they don't have uh, a lot of nimbleness to them. The Way Shark gives us the capability to, again, get into some problem areas that we've noticed over the years. It's a super exciting new piece of technology that we're looking forward to piloting here this summer. All right, that's really cool. And we have another really cool thing to show you now. Some drivers in cottage country got an unexpected assist from a soccer superstar and an Oscar nominee this weekend. Yeah. Okay, so they're living. Hurry up. Uh, yeah. Hurry up. Uh, that's so it. the cards can go through. Footballer David Beckham and actor Austin Butler were among those who lifted a tree over their heads in Muskoka to let cars pass through. The act was caught on video by none other than Beckham's wife, former Spice Girl Victoria Beckham. 